Well, welcome everyone and welcome to our attendees. Um, we were just in executive session for the purpose to discuss issues related to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body, specifically school secretaries, custodians, and cafeteria workers. So our open meeting on this date is now open. And um, let's see, should we take a roll call at this Here. time? And uh, Jess Riley? Here. Leo Brem. Here. Megan Glenn? Here. Tim Knight? Here, and I'm just switching my audio. Okay, that's cool. Super. All righty, so at this point, um, we are going to open it up for public input. Citizens at this time may address the committee on items of school business not on the agenda. The committee will take such items under advisement without action at the meeting during which the item is presented. So, um, I think there's one in there. Um, all right, Chris McHugh Potts. Two point of order questions. Why not allow for video participation during Q&A and public input instead of asking attendees to type and submit? Other town boards and committees allow for video. Will you allow for question comments after diversity and Dale agenda items? Absolutely, yes. And video, I, I, I don't mind. Um, last week we, we did bring over some folks and so um, we don't prohibit that in any way. So I hope that clarifies. Alrighty, so. So yes, again, we will allow for um, comments after each item. However, so sorry, I didn't print this out. So we'll go right into the first order of new business. Dr. Marston, COVID-19 funding resolution, or rather Jess Riley. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is the resolution that I brought up last week that I read that the MASC is asking us to approve as a school committee. And they've asked uh, school committees across the state to approve it to show a level of unity around um, funding the unfunded mandates that have come out of guidance for, um, for the reopening of schools or however the beginning of the school year goes. So um, if you'd like me to, I will uh, read it. How do you procedurally want to do this, Madam Chair? Do you? Uh... Yes, if you could please read it. You read mm -hmm. the first draft last time. So if you could okay. please. And there's read been it. no change. No, okay, fantastic. Check so the date. Yep, read it again, and then we can take a vote on it. Okay. Please. So uh, the uh, resolution reads, uh, the Medfield Public Schools School Committee resolution COVID-19 state funding dated June 29th, 2020. This will go to uh, the governor, the secretary of education, James Pizer, the commissioner of uh, the department of elementary and secondary ed, Massachusetts Senate president, the house speaker, the state senator, Paul Feeney, representative Dooley, representative Garlic, as well as the selectmen warrant committee and town administrator from Medfield. And the resolution reads, Whereas, if schools are to reopen this fall in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, it is the responsibility of each school district to do so safely and responsibly. And whereas it is the responsibility of the state to ensure that each school district is able to pay for the enormous additional staffing, transportation, and material expenses required to do this. And whereas the state cannot expect mandatory COVID-19 safety guidelines to be followed without also ensuring that each school district has the funds required to implement these guidelines. Therefore, let it be resolved that the state must guarantee every school district full reimbursement for whatever COVID-19 expenses are required to follow state mandates. We must ensure a statewide school reopening that is safe, responsible, and equitable. There can be no unfunded mandates for COVID-19. 
Uh, would anybody like to uh, make a motion to approve? Make a motion to approve. Thank you. So moved. Um, do we have a second? I second. second. All right, so Leo Brem seconded by Megan Glenn, and we will take a roll call vote. Jess Riley? Aye. Leo Brem? Aye. Megan Glenn? Aye. Tim Knight? Aye. And Anna Mae O'Shea Brook? Aye. That motion passes. Thank you, Jess. Well, thank you to the MASC, and I certainly hope it helps. There are a lot of different funding mechanisms, but uh, certainly, there are going to be things that fall through the cracks. So let's uh, just act as a team. All right, so second um, on the agenda under new business is diversity, equity, inclusion, mascot discussion and engagement plan. Um, I have received and have passed on to all school committee members many, many letters, um, beautifully crafted, thoughtful letters um, from folks um, in support of changing the mascot. But I'd like to remind folks that um, the discussion about the mascot was really brought to our attention just two weeks ago. And so tonight we decided to, to have this evening speak amongst all um, committee members in terms of moving forward. How do we engage the community? How do we get the information out there and then take a vote um, after? Um, I'm thinking at the end of the summer, but we can discuss that. I'd like to know what um, people are thinking. In, in my view, um, I need to tell you folks that um, a student reached out to me, a, a current rising senior, Marissa Gorog. She wrote me a lovely email saying that she would like to organize students on both sides of the argument, or, or, or of the discussion, I should say. Um, students who are in favor and students who are against. And she asked if she could do that. And I said, absolutely. And I'm very grateful that she did reach out to me. And um, so she would like to, her student panel of students are available. I gave her all the dates. And um, so I just wanna throw this out there. They're available on July 30th. Um, to speak to us and um, not knowing, because we had not discussed any plan of when we would have our open forum for discussion and invite community members to, to present. So um, that is one date. And um, also I've heard feedback. I suppose some folks would like us to make an immediate vote, but my personal feeling is that we take this time, and I think I mentioned it at the last meeting, um, I would hate to do something over the summer immediately without giving folks proper time to give us their feedback. And I think that, um, you know, I've even heard students, high school students say, I don't understand why it's, why it's bad. So I think to me that signifies education. You know, we, we really need to have um, broader discussions. So um, that's why I would prefer not to have an immediate vote, but to build up to that um, towards the end of the summer. But I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. You, when you're saying vote, you're, you're meaning the school committee as a, yeah, and not a vote taken throughout the town of... No, no, school committee vote. School committee vote, yeah. Well, <coughs> Anime, I conceptualize these as two separate issues. Okay. We have the logo itself, which is a caricature, however well meant at the time that it was developed, uh, of a kind of faux Native American representative of some sort. And across multiple platforms, uh, of which I am very happy to kind of provide a list of the ones that I have looked at. Um, this is seen as cultural appropriation and in no way an honor that Native Americans have asked for, enjoy, or need. Now, I can't speak as a member of the Native American population, as a member of the nation of the Massachusetts um, 
tribe or any of the sub tribes that overlapped in this area. I, I can't do that, but I can tell you that I feel as though it's been very clear about the impact that Native American mascots have on uh, the psychological well being of children within schools, the messaging that it provides. And I can't rectify the logo itself with what we say we are doing as a district, which is trying to expand um, our and our children's understanding of uh, the world and of our internal understandings of other people, of difference. And um, so I see the logo as something that for me is not I have thought this decision out for a very long time. I have known for a long time that it is time for this to go. I am glad that the community brought it to us and I, and I feel like that's a gift. There is a separate part of it, which is that there is the name. And I think that that's a really significant discussion that we should have at the community level. And that, that is a long-term discussion around if we continue to use the warrior moniker, what does warrior mean to Medfield? What qualities are there in a warrior? Is that culturally specific to Native Americans or is that a wider cultural concept throughout the world? And what do we feel is that definition? If in the end, the community feels as though that they do not want a warrior, then what do we become? So I really feel like the, the discussion of logo of the current graphic that we have is a different discussion than uh, how we perceive ourselves going forward. And a lot of the letters that I've seen, the communications I've seen have been, no, I'm okay with getting rid of the logo, but please let's stay warriors. There have also been other people who say, no, once warrior has been attached to a Native American label, then, then you will never cleave the two apart. And there are people who say, keep everything. But I think we know from, or at least I know, that there is a general consensus among the psychological and educational communities that Native American logos are not appropriate and are hurtful. And that there's a lot of background to that. And I'm very happy to, you know, put that out there. And I do think it is an educational conversation. I do think that there is a part of this that we should have uh, or that the community should have the opportunity to certainly speak about their views to it. But I also think that these are two different decisions, right? So there's one that is important in terms of doing what I believe is right. And we decide that as a, as a committee. Um, and we talk about that back and forth about whether that's what the full committee decides. But I also think that there is a part of this that's very important that becomes a longer process around understanding what our goals are as a community and in the schools. And I think I need a lot more student input before uh, we make that vote or you know make those changes. I need student input. I think we need stakeholder input. We need alumni input. We really need to open that up. I don't see... Um, I don't see the fall as a very, uh, I feel like the fall is a little too long for a number of reasons. Um, one, we have this gift this year that almost everybody, even if they're on vacation, is on Wi-Fi, right? We can really put out that this is something that we are talking about and we want input. Um, and the other thing is, is that once we get to the fall, we are having 
many, many, many other discussions, and I don't want this one to get completely lost. We're having discussions about Dale Street. We're having discussions about reentry. We're having discussions about a number of different things. Let's make this, it may feel a little rushed, but let's make this something that is a priority to do while we have the time in the summer. So that's kind of been my thought around it. I don't know, does anybody else have any uh, yeah, Leo, too, Megan. Yeah, I, I can echo um, a lot of what Jess said that the, about the, it's apparent what the concerns are and the separate issues. Oh, wait, you sorry, know. Leo, one second. Um, I, I do notice that there are some, um, there's some notes in the Q&A, and if you could please we, have your full name right. um, um, listed in there, please. So there's an anonymous attendee note and an SRC. I'm sorry. Um, so just sorry. Just put it in the body of this. Yeah, if you could just tell me who you are, I will happily read it. Thank you. Yeah, and then we'll answer those afterwards, right? Because we do want to be able yeah. to have this conversation. Yeah, yeah. Here. yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah, so I, I want to echo exactly what you know Jess was saying. I, I also feel that it's, it is time uh, to continue the evolution like many communities have across the country. Uh, you know, regardless of the current state of affairs, this has obviously been a concern in the past here in Medfield. The question has come up many times. Um, and it continues to come up and rightfully so. And, you know, the conversation about, uh, you know, the, the learning process to the community as a whole and being involved in that process, I believe is, is warranted. Um, I also feel strongly that as a school community, you know, we need to communicate clearly, um, you know, our stance on, uh, on equity and how we uh, depict other folks, you know, in the community. Um, you know, even if we don't have Native Americans readily available to participate in the conversation, um, we have, you know, to some of the, to answer or to speak to some of the questions in there, we have received feedback through some of the emails um, from Native American communities. And this has been not the first time this has come up nationally, um, or even here in Massachusetts, including the communities of Natick um, and another and Dedham. Uh, and there's some, you know, there are areas where this has come up in the past. Um, I do want to also echo what Jess is saying that we do need to uh, have a strong community involvement. Uh, and whatever's decided uh, to replace the, you know, the mascot and the representation of Medfield. You know, I, I have no problem with the term warrior, um, you know, what it means to be part of a team and everything that uh, encompasses the meanings of, um, you know, of teamwork and uh, collaboration amongst our community as a whole. So, uh, but I will, I will say that I do feel strongly uh, about this, you know, about this. And I also do not want it to overshadow uh, the other work that needs to be done because it, um, you know, reentry into school and, you know, is extremely important. So, um, and to me, you know, that uh, I don't want this to get muddled up in that as well. Um, they have, they have some equal weight. Uh, and uh, the Dale Street project obviously has a lot to do with, you know, um, our future as well. Uh, space in our learning community as a whole. So um, all of these deserve very a lot of attention and we have a lot of work to do. Um, and so I echo those pieces and I want that to be uh, part of this conversation. Thank you, Leo. Here, Megan. Um, yeah, you know, Meg, yeah, Megan, why don't you go ahead? I'll share my opinion. Okay, sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to repeat everything that's been said, but um, I have been reading through the very well-crafted uh, messages that have been coming to us. And um, unlike a large percentage of this town, I am not from here. And I did move here as an adult and with my children. And um, so I, I have a different view probably than a lot of people and I understand that this is part of a tradition, a long line of tradition and, and warrior pride. And um, that being said, I don't think this is uh, really a decision to strike something down, but to rather start a 
broader discussion of what it's perceived as outside of Medfield, because sometimes you mean it's so much a part of you that you can't see um, from the outside. Uh, I'm actually from Illinois, and a lot of the articles online kind of reference the example of Chief Alain Iwick at the University of Illinois. And I um, have several siblings of mine that went there, and I was in Illinois when that became a hugely uh, div dividing event. Uh, do we get rid of Chief Alain Iwick? And uh, even to this day, there are people that are upset about it being banned uh, this mascot that did an address in Native American garb and did a um, a dance uh, at halftime and with half saying, well, we've asked the Native Americans themselves and we have studied their dances. Um, but we, let me just read to you what a quote that I just read about this. It says, and this is, um, a professor of media at University of Illinois during this process says, you can take away the obvious and more blatant images, but it's hard to change the hearts and minds of people, she said. This is diametrically opposed to the mission of an educational institution, which is about teaching history and not reinforcing stereotypes of any groups of people. And so I think by us, you know, I, again, I reiterate with what Jess said, I'm really glad that this finally has come up and we're discussing this. And I understand that there's a division in, in the town and that nothing is going to be really, we're not gonna be able to move on and pass this until we educate everybody about what this means to various groups of people. So I don't wanna rush through this either. I do understand that there is two different discussions here being the logo itself and the name warrior. And I, I do think there's a little bit of room in there, but I, I think we need to hear from both sides so that it doesn't look like, and I already see in some of the comments that, you know, school committee has come in and, and, and dropped the gavel on this and, and made a decision when that's not an entirely fair statement to make and that we are really being cognizant of all the different viewpoints on this, so. Thank you, Megan. Tim, did you want to add anything? No, yeah, I, I mean, without repeating a lot of great, great comments, I mean, my, my view is I think it's appropriate now to limit the scope to the mascot. I think there absolutely is the broader discussion, you know, it goes beyond warrior. I, I think the broader discussion is more around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and almost a follow up to um, the conversation last week that Zach helped lead. I think that is a much, that's where our hearts and minds really should be. Um, I think the mascot, I, I would ask basic questions. Have we changed it in the past? What is the operational impact if we were to change the mascot? And personally, I, I don't really, I think that is not, um, I don't think we need to overthink that one. And I, I apologize if, if folks are really beholden to that, but have we, have we changed it in the past? When, what would the impact be? I think it's, you know, I'm all for changing the mascot, turning it out. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that the operational question is a good one. Can you give us, or can you and Michael uh, help us with some data around what, if we were to change the mascot itself, or not even change it, but just currently kind of um, retire what we have now in terms of the graphic. Um, could you give us kind of a cost estimate around what would be the kind of fast, uh, low hanging fruit kinds of things that we could do? And then as we take a look around the district, what would it cost in the long term? to uh, kind of change the logo, how, what would our process have to be around that in terms of, you know, like the, in terms of timeline? You know, sure, obviously this is an incredibly tight money year. We're not using this any longer to, you know, or we may not be using this any longer to represent ourselves. I certainly hope not. But what does that process operationally look like? 
Yeah, we could, yeah. we could do that. We could put, I mean, it, any change to any logo and anything is going to be a price tag as, as associated with that. So, and obviously it's a worthy cost. We could we, we we do that. Year. Yeah. So how do we, how do we do that? And how does that affect our timeline? Should we decide as a committee to uh, kind of abolish the logo? And also what are the kind of commensurate costs involved with uh, working around how to uh, educate and engage the community in a discussion around what our new identity might be or keeping our identity and how do we, how do we tweak that? How do we really uh, have those discussions um, as a community? Is there, are there speakers we need to bring in? Does that become part of uh, Medfield Speaks, Medfield Talks? Is that kind of where are those uh, timeline issues around education and community education and student engagement, alumni engagement, business engagement? You know, there are a lot of stakeholders, although this is our decision in the end and everything kind of stops here. We also need to hear from the community. You know, I, I walked through several stores this week and I just looked around and saw how many pieces of merchandise there are with this logo on it. We obviously need to be bringing in our, our business holders, the people who have really supported us over the years and, and talk to them about how we plan to change and, you know, what we try to do with them. And they're a big part of this as well. Same thing with the PTO, MCPE, any of these organizations, the sports organizations, the town sports organizations, you know, there are a lot of stakeholders here. And I still haven't heard enough from our current kids, our current students. Not about the logo so much, but about the longer term discussion around, you know, diversity, equity, implicit bias. This is a, this is an opportunity for us but it's not gonna be without cost. All right, I'd like to pop into the Q&A unless a, another school committee member would like to well, say something. I'm less worried about the cost because I, you know, I think it's an evolution over time. Um, yeah. You know, people are referencing Walpole. Um, you know, Jeff and I spoke earlier. a five year conversation. It just happened to end it, real fast. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. right? I mean, it's even more than five years, right? There was a gentleman that kept that flag painted on his garage until he passed away up, up, above the field, you know? Um, and I had a sister-in-law lived across the street from high school, so I used to see it unfold quite a bit. Um, you know, and it's, and it's uh, again, I, you know, I want to echo that it's, it's about messaging. And yes, the conversation's important. The input's important. The input is important. And, um, you know, and tough decisions is what we were elected for. And, you know, sometimes tough does not mean popular. And, you know, and unfortunately, you know, we have to make some unpopular decisions at times. Uh, and that's what leadership is. And, you know, and I implore my colleagues on the committee here to, you know, stick to that, um, you know, as we go through the process, because there will be some sort of process, you know, it is not replacing the uh, the heart and soul of the community, and it's not painting any bad image of Medfield Public Schools. It's merely making the logo that sometimes represents us less offensive uh, to certain communities. And the reason for that can be a teachable moment for both, you know, graduates, uh, our students K to 12, uh, and so on. And even the discussion can be rich as part of that learning process. And um, and I guess I want to make sure that that is stated before we go into the Q&A. Um, uh, so it is, a, it is a hard decision, right? Because we want to make sure that we're inclusive, but that inclusivity, you know, is also some of the silence, the silence that we hear that, you know, that may be offended by it uh, or have been working into the bigger messaging about why it's offensive to some people and what that means to uh, those conversations we have with our, with our students and our, uh, and our children. No. I'm just going to piggyback on you, Leo. I mean, we could certainly right now say it's gone. Let's move on. And that would that would not address even the the issue really at hand is is that that it's offensive and degrading and wrong. And without that education piece, um, it's just going to harbor a resentment and further divide the town. And I, I know I keep going back to the chief of Lion Eye Wick, um, but that is what they've pinpointed as the problem 
it was a knee-jerk reaction to the NCAA that said no more uh, logos used using Native American images. So the University of Illinois said, okay, the NCAA made us do this no more. And they were lacking the piece of the education and the community, community uh, collaboration. And so that's still festering to this day. This is like 13 years later that um, they don't understand why it's fundamentally biased and, and, and wrong. So that's why I, I believe that Again, we don't want this to be a knee-jerk reaction, and um, we need to make sure that we're putting into motion the education component and bringing people along with us and uh, creating something that's going to bring the community together and not divide us more. Yeah, you know, I think this is an example of, um, you know, a teaching opportunity, you know, when, when different groups disagree how can we find commonality or how can we be examples to our children and our, you know, and, and the rest of the community of, of how we're, of how we can work together, at least try to, you know, we should make an attempt. So to me, I feel like they've, they've lost this battle. Yeah. So yeah, no, the, and I, that's, that's not what we want here. But yeah, I mean, that's why I feel strongly that we should not you know, be voting tonight. Right. I, I yeah. do, I feel very strongly in, in engagement and education and understanding. And you're right, this is not gonna be, you know, whatever we decide is, is not gonna be popular with everyone. But if we can make, if our intention, I, I believe in intention, you know, what is our intention here? And our intention is to make the best possible um, choice for our, for our town. But I, I, again, like I said the last time, you know, we wanna, we want to, um, call people in and not out. And so we'll do the very best we can. And with that, I will open up to Q&A. Actually, can and we quickly for a second, really honestly look at our calendars and our meeting dates for the next several, yeah, so, several meetings? Because yeah. I, I mean, I think that there's uh, a piece of this in which we can talk about this, but I also want to make sure that we're really looking at at timelines and lodestones around. Okay, I was going to do that after the Q&A. Okay. Sure. Yeah, great. I just want to make sure that that's something of note for now. For yeah, absolutely. So, uh, on an anonymous attendee, if you could please write your name somewhere down the line, that would be great. And SRC is Steve Kasky. So, has the school board reached out to local Native American tribes to obtain their opinions? With recent events going on, we should be able to let these tribes speak about something that affects them instead of using our white privilege to tell tribes what they believe. Many tribes feel proud of their logo and some have in fact sued schools to restore the logo. It sounds like some school committee members have made their own decisions before, there was, um, before this was presented and it's really unfortunate. Um, well, Steve, I think this is going to be part of the discussion and after the Q&A, we will come up with a timeline in terms of when we'll have a forum and a public forum for folks to be engaged, students, as Jeff said, stakeholders, etc. I did receive an email today from Richard DeSorga, who, um, DeSorga, who did reach out to um, a tribe. Uh, so this will absolutely be part of the discussion and this is part of bringing people, people along. Um, Christella Wade, are there any Native Americans on the committee to speak to their cultural perceptions? If this is about diversity and inclusion, changing the logo name without Native Americans input could serve as the exact social injustice that you are advocating for. All right, I think that was spoken to in, in the same vein as Steve Caskey's question. Would it be possible for the committee to reach out to the indigenous legislative agenda or similar group to see if they would be interested in sending a representative to future discussions? I think they could provide a valuable perspective on this issue. Uh, again, part of the discussion, absolutely. Christella Way changing the mascot, which should be referenced as a logo instead goes fundamentally deeper than cost to the school system there. Um, 
Alex Mader, what message are you intending to send to our community, especially our children, that every committee member is taking a firm stance on disapproving of the logo, but we're not actually taking any action right now. This is confusing message and I'm hearing is we all agree it's wrong, but we're scared of upsetting some people. What is the intended message? Because I'd like to explain it to the children effectively. Alex made um, here. Can I answer that one? Please. Alex, I think that uh, I wanna clear that up. What we're saying is we want to have an educational process so that the people who are not feeling as we do right now, understand why we do and understand the background to our decision or to my decision at least. So I know that that's something that you've been trying to do as well. Um, but what would the message be also if we were to simply not listen to anyone else? And just what would that decision be for our kids? That doesn't mean that we don't value the decision. It means that we value it so much we want it to stick and we feel that people need to be heard. There's no harm or shame in hearing. So just to be very clear about that, um, it's not about upsetting people it's about helping people come along with us. And I think we said that last week as well. Thanks, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Sandy Canavan, I know the alumni have a vested interest in being involved as well as the town. Would they be considered in the voting as well as the town? I think this would be very important to include others. So I think as just mentioned, this, this is really too, this is a two-pronged issue. Um, the logo, one, and um, the, the use of the, the word warrior. So I, I, what I'd like to propose at the end is, is how we proceed. So um, that'll get clarified um, in just a bit, hopefully. Um, Alex, furthermore, whose feelings are more important to the school committee at this very moment? The diverse, disenfranchised, traumatized, and terrorized Native American population or ignorant people of Medfield who refuse education on this issue? Well, Alex, uh, I, I think that, you know, just, just reiterated it. I did just a few moments again uh, ago, and so, um, and, and I'm not gonna go into, um, really casting folks against each other. I, I'm really hoping that we can try to at least attempt to educate or at least, you know, allow that time for it to happen. Um, Jean Minio, there have been offers of donations to help with cost of changing the logo. Should the school committee, should the school committee make the decision? Is that possible? And what is the operational process? Could donations go to MCPE, make grants for new uniforms, scoreboard, et cetera? Um, uh, Jeff or Michael, process. you want to, yeah. I think, uh, Jeff, you did say that you would, that will be. Um, so we'll, yeah, so we'll take a look at what the cost implications are and okay. we'll provide a report for you on that. And then that, you know, and the avenue if we if 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 donations are made and how right. that would work. Okay, good. Thank All right. Here's the other thing is I, I want to be very clear that the reason I asked for a cost estimate was simply because we have two jobs essentially. It's uh, policy and it's budget. And if there are operational implications to this, then we need to be the stewards of the town's money in the best way that we can. And I know that as a group we try to honor that. That's a process question, not necessarily a question that this decision would hinge on. It's truly about process and all of the facets that we need to think of when we are making a decision like this. So just to kind of make sure that nobody thinks that I'm gonna say, oh, there's a price tag on this particular decision because there, there isn't. Okay, thanks. Great, um, next question, how would you like to hear from kids on the DEI bias 
And can you identify a time frame? Yes. So as I mentioned, Jean, at um, the beginning, senior Marissa Gorok, she's the student who approached me in terms of organizing students on both sides. And um, so she's coordinating that. So I would, I would have any students interested um, to contact Marissa Gorog um, because she is the one who will coordinate the, the student portion, or at least the, the students in our schools now. So I hope that helps. Alex. They can, also, they can also always email us directly as well. Yeah. So. Yep. But I, I think it's great that we have a student volunteer who really wants to organize this, though I think we should empower them to, um, to take that on. So I, I'm, I'm very grateful to Marissa. Um, but you're right. Um, kids, students have been sending us emails and I've been distributing them to other school committee, uh, to all the school committee members. Um, Sandy, you know it's going to be gone. Um, Christella Wade. Oh wait, no, Alex. Um, if you know it's going to be gone, what should people do all summer when they're printing t-shirts, banners, marketing materials, making signs for birthdays? This is really confusing messaging for the community. Um, really, same message. <laughs> And, and I'm sorry it's so frustrating, Alex, but we really, we really want to make a conscientious effort to, to bring people in. Um, Christella Wade, if you allow the students to make the decision, which Medfield is 92% white, how would this change ac accurately, this change accurately represent the very culture that you don't want to offend? Um, it's not a student vote, it's a school committee vote, and we're gonna have a public forum so that we can hear from, um, from all sectors. And um, so I hope that clarifies that. Um, Christella, is mine coming through as anonymous? If so, okay, thank you, Christella. Sandy, I recently have reached out to the Wampanoag tribe and not all logos are offensive. They have offered their assistance. Yes, and um, Richard DeSorger also reached out to them and, and I've seen their response as well. Um, Nicole, um, there is a tremendous amount of research proving that indigenous peoples who support native mascots do so because they are not amply represented, represented throughout the rest of society. This is a larger issue of lacking in inclusivity and diversity education that was referenced during um, Zach and Christine's presentation. Okay, um, Steve, leadership is to represent the community's interests and beliefs. How are you representing the community without taking into account the resident sentiment? To assume the symbol is offensive based off of your feelings is not leadership, but knee-jerk reactions to mob mentality and shows the lack of education involving this subject, as well as the wishes of many tribes across the country. There was communication with the local tribe chief through email and he has stated that it is that as long, long as, as okay. Um, Steve, okay. That'll, be part of, that'll be part of the forum. Um, all right. Um, and not just, okay, so Kat, uh, Nicole, when we consider the logo and warrior name as two separate items, I would love if residents could consider what we are clinging to with the name of warrior. What is at stake if we retire this name and what do we stand to gain in rethinking of a new direction? Giovanni, great name. Um, Colantonio, in addition to removing the logo and educating people as to why, would Medfield also be looking to strengthen its curriculum around Native American history in Medfield? I feel that during my time in Med at Medfield High School, we learned a very sanitized version of history that creates the ongoing barrier as alumni, alumni don't often understand the, what the full problem is. Um, Jeff, do you wanna to speak to that? Because I know Christine has done some work on that in terms of the curriculum. So um, I think we mentioned at the last meeting as well. So we have um, done some work redoing the, fr the frameworks have, um, have come out in social studies and we're working on redoing the current curriculum and including that information on there. We 
had had some, um, we had a, a professor who is a, a, a citizen of the Wampanoag tribe who's gonna be working with our teachers this, this spring, but unfortunately COVID-19 hit, um, but we're gonna be scheduling her to work with um, teachers again in the fall to really give a different perspective in terms of like Rocky Woods. So we're always looking at that, the Pilgrim perspective and, and try to get um, a full view of what, you know, what happened in terms of Medfield and Thanksgiving and that kind of thing. So we've done that. And I know that Christine is working with the social studies department, um, middle school and high school too, to, to revamp that curriculum. So that's, we started doing that earlier this year. And unfortunately um, when COVID-19 hit, it put a stall on that. Thank you. Um, I think we established that anonymous attendee is Christella. Did we? Uh, I don't know, 618. So this would be the latest comment. Whoever put up the latest comment there, um, if you could identify yourself in the next, uh, next question, that would be really helpful. Anyone? Please. Well, we once that's uh, once that is identified, I think it'd be worthwhile maybe reading with omitting uh, third party names. Uh, uh, Kevin, response. Kevin, are you saying um, that you are the uh, Kevin R. Holbrook? Are you saying you're the anonymous attendee? Uh, I don't think that's possible. <laughs> well, maybe he changed his. Oh yes, no, he said that is me. That is me. Okay, great, great, great. Lovely. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so, has Richard Desorger written anything publicly on this, particularly regarding the history of Medfield Public Schools and the evolution of the name and mascot over time? He has uh, has he offered any public statement? His word carries much weight and provides long term context and understanding. So Richard DeSorger, um, I did reach out to him and he did um, send me an email and um, gave us context in terms of, he reached out to alumni from, um, and I'll get it quickly. Class of 1950 and class of 1952. Yes, exactly, thank you. And um, why am I, I'm just quickly looking for it. And, and 56. then, sorry? And 1956. Yeah. Yes, so um, here we go. So here we go. Um, so Richard DeSorger did reach out to, um, to folks so the, the the apparel oh so so the logo of the native american war warrior first appeared in 1959 on sports you know on logos and um anecdotally he was told that um there was a contest to select a mascot and that was selective selected and then and it stayed a native american um it stayed the native american warrior with full headdress until 2002 when Superintendent Bob McGuire made the, made the more modern warrior design and changed the original at the time when many schools were dropping the Native American symbols and names. McGuire designed it in such a way that it could or could not be the image of Native Americans, depending on how you looked at it. Um, he had some additional information. He contacted some alumni, the class of 1950 and 1952, and also, as Leo said, someone from the class of 1956, and there was never a Native American warrior um, on any of the sports uniforms. And it first appeared on uniforms in the... Um, in 1955 in the yearbook, as, as I stated. Um, so he also reached out to... 59, I think, 1959. Yeah. Um, yeah so he then contacted the tribal historians and archivists of the Wampanoag tribe um, in Mashpee, whom he knows personally, and asked them their opinion as Native Americans concerning the mascot. And it showed, um, and he showed them the current warrior mascot. And here's the response. Um, it is cultural appropriation in a manner that portrays Native Americans as savage, barbaric, warlike people. Yes, it is offensive. And then, um, and then another person had shared um, 
the intertribal resolution from the National Indian Education Association and also references research on the harms and impacts of mascots on tribal youth and a link to that clip that um, I'll share with Andrea and we'll put in, in, you know, in the minutes so, and, and, um, so we can find it. And then, um, um, so that is what Richard shared with us and, um, so I hope that is helpful and not, uh, okay. I would, or I just, add, we have, I, yeah. I would just add that um, what we learned recently was that the current uh, mascot and logo uh, was not locally designed. That was from uh, University of South Dakota fighting Sioux. I saw that. Has been, which was used for a long time. So I know that I was always told that it was designed locally as well, but that isn't the case. Yeah, so if nothing else, we have a copyright problem. Um, yeah, I also have to say that uh, I, Isn't that I funny? cannot in my heart of hearts say that I think it is, oh, that it somehow makes a logo better if you can pretend that it's just somebody who's not a Native American wearing a headdress. I mean, that that seems to be the, the um, definition of cultural appropriation right there. So, you know, it's either a Native American that we've put together with a headdress that has no historical re relevance to this area, or we are condoning the just neutral some schmo wearing a Native American costume as our mascot. And I, and I think that that's, both of those are intensely problematic for me. But anime or Jeff, is there a section on the, under the school committee part of the website that we can start uh, cataloging some of these um, links to statements and other pieces of research that that we've seen and that we're collecting from, you know, that yeah. we're kind of using to kind of use these decisions from these kind of mainstream psychological and cultural. That, is that something you want us to put on the website? I great. Yeah, I think that that's necessary because I think that we need to be able to show that this is not something that we're just kind of pulling from from midair, but that this is there's a solid body of, of research and opinion and resolution behind you, this. Could you just let me know what you want on there? Okay. okay. Yeah. Thanks. So whatever whatever you decide. That's a great yeah. idea. Yes, thanks. Jeff. Yeah, the resources that Paula, not Paula, but the other person sent over would be good. That and link. Alex, yeah, yeah, Alexis yeah. Hill. She, yeah. Jeff, you said that the um, the graphic that is currently the the mascot was taken from University of North Dakota. Mm -hmm. I think it's South Dakota, but yes, South Dakota, yeah. and has since been removed as their mascot. I believe so. <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> usually, usually, Megan, I'm the one who has a hard time controlling my face. <laughs> Uh, Justin, I see Jackie Corrigan has also put up a question on there as well. And yeah, I don't think multiple. we're talking about, yeah, I don't think we're talking about getting rid of the warrior name. Um, I don't think that's the conversation. That's part of a process. Yeah, yeah that's, that's part, yeah, part of a whole. Yeah. All right, so I'll go on to the next one. Um, I, I forget Garcia's first name, M.A. Garcia. As a teacher in the system, I can speak to the disconnect between the culture of the warrior, resourceful, resilient, courageous, and the graphic image of the warrior head, which though, may, um, though made abstract, still clearly represents a stereotypical image and cultural appropriation. I, like many of my colleagues, am uncomfortable wearing medfield apparel to events such as the pep rally because of this image. Furthermore, while I support the call for indigenous peoples to speak directly to the impact of our town's mascot, I would hate to, to see us ask those indigenous people to do the emotional labor to educate us as to why this is harmful. It's not unlike asking people of color to explain why black lives matter. I, I thoroughly agree with you. For um, sure. And that is something that I have been very uncomfortable with through this entire discussion. Um, 
that I've seen online is that I feel as though uh, major representative organizations of Native Americans have made their views quite clear on this. And then going back to kind of continually test, is it okay now? If I ask one member of a community, do they represent the entire community? There's, there's an educational piece to that as well. So thanks. Great, um, Melissa Coughlin, um, she did ask if I could read um, what Richard said. And you know, what I should also add to that is how, so Richard says, personally as a student and then a teacher, I always viewed the full held dressed warrior we had up until 2007 as being a proud warrior and not being derog derogatory. But I was looking through the eyes of a non-Native American. I hope this helps. Um, okay, and then, um, okay, I did, did mention Kaylin's Kasky's um, question. Jackie Corgan, it sounds like the committee has already made a decision without taking public input and taking into account Native American sentiment. Sad. I grew up in Medfield and now I am raising my kids here. Taking offense to the term warrior is utterly ridiculous. Keep Medfield Warriors, change the logo. I don't care either way, but keep the warrior name. Okay, so Jackie, I just wanna make sure that you understand that we actually are, we're kind of, I think, arguing the same point, that the logo is offensive, but the warrior is a whole different discussion and there is no decision made about warrior at this point or not. I think that the, the rest of us can say that, right? That that's, that we really do believe that this is part of a community discussion. I mean, I, I hope that helps and I hope that you don't feel unheard in that way. But I wanna make sure you know that that's two separate issues, at least to me. Um, Christella Wade, that is inaccurate. I find a, a citation within Britannica referencing the Library of Congress using a full headdress. Finally, a different headdress is worn for different occasions. In the illustration, the headdress worn by Medicom when meeting with settlers is also to believe to bring um, the wearer's strength. It is very important to understand the relevance of the culture and why certain attire is worn and when. What are you doing to educate yourselves? Um, I would say we are and we will do more. Um, are you collecting research from both sides to remove or keep from the town? That was from- It's Sydney. tough to find research that says keep. You know, that tends to be uh, kind of opinion-based but not necessarily research-based. But we will certainly continue to, to look. Um, this is not an, uh, a finished process, but I have not yet seen anything that says keeping uh, a mascot that is stereotypic in its portrayal is, uh, is something that is uh, desirable, I guess is the best word I can think of it right now. Jean Minier says University of South Dakota switched to Fighting Hawks, Stephen Rice, the UND Fighting Sioux, which we copied, changed to the Fighting Hawks. Okay, Emily. Um, hi, this is Emily um, Bazogian. Did I pronounce that correct? In response to individuals discussing how tribes have said uh, the mascot is okay, it's critical to remember that Native Americans, indigenous people, are not a monolith. I do think it's important to listen to Native Americans and look at scientific literature on the impact of the mascot as previously mentioned. But I want to emphasize that we need to listen to many, um, to many voices and cannot associate one individual's opinion on the mascot with an entire group of people. Thank you. Alexis Hill, I don't want to uh, I don't want to ask a question. Just let the SE know it was the University of South Dakota. Please see the, uh, yes, all right. Stephen Reich, in the same way we don't, uh, we wouldn't use any other current religious minority, marginalized ethnic group or other race as a mascot. We don't have the right to use an indigenous person either. Replace Indian warrior with another stereotype of a minority person and you can see how it is obviously wrong. When a group from a dominant race of people take imagery from a race of people that have horribly um, uh, subjugated in order to use 
it for their own entertainment and pleasure that is a racist act, plain and simple. Alexis Hill, dear school committee, I will forward my full correspondence to you. But for today, I do want to share that a Native American educator, Claudie Fox Tree emailed, yes, both Anna Juan and I do this kind of work within our presentations, though I don't know how much he intends, attends schools, school committee or community meetings. I have testified at the state level, but do not attend local meetings for various reasons. Among the issues is my own family's safety. I live in one of those towns with the, ma with the mascot. It's very different being from the oppressed group than being from the dominant in these toxic environments. In addition, I feel that it, it is the responsibility of the ally to convince other people who are like them because in fact, this is an issue for everyone, not just indigenous people. Thank you. Um, We've had Anna Juan uh, here before, right? I know that I've seen Anna Juan before and I think he's come, was he at Dale Street a couple of years ago or was it Wheelock? I'm not unfamiliar with him. I believe it was Wheelock. Yeah. All right, and the last um, comment, and we'll move on to the next, and then we'll, we'll, we'll figure out our timeline, and we're gonna have a public forum where we can have the voices. Um, Nicole says to the previous commenter, the Wampanoag did not wear headdress, wore bonnets. So not only is it offensive, it's inaccurate. Alrighty, um, thank you very much for everyone's input. So, um, as I said, Marissa Gorog had said that um, July 30th, so the, our next meeting is July 16th, then July 30th, then August 13th, then August 27th. We're, um, so Mar Marissa had said that July 30th would be a good date for um, the students to, to speak. Um, and so I'm wondering if we can have, but I did mention to her that I may request, um, because we hadn't spoken, um, we may request a, a, re uh, a repeat recap or something on, on August 30th. But um, I'm wondering if we could have our public forum regarding the logo um, on July 30th or August 13th and want to know what you guys think. I'd rather go for the 30th, frankly, if we could do that. Um, just because I really would like to be able to, you know, as we have a public forum, then, you know, then we need to be able to kind of come up with more of a kind of, just depending on what is happening at that point and what we've heard. And I'd like to, then start to kind of make a, a very specific timeline around how we we look at this issue going through you know how do we look at the warrior and and also being respectful of many other decisions that we need to make out through the year um, and being able to bring in our curriculum um, and uh, bringing in Christine and bringing in our uh, community program review um, head who is Mary Brule and really kind of talking to them also in terms of feedback and how that looks through the year when we're talking about making decisions and holding um, additional forums or information gathering or education and uh, throughout the school year around what the warrior, the, the logo and the education around that, I'm mean, not the logo, sorry, the, the warrior moniker and everything else kind of beyond that, you know? Yeah, I, I was thinking part one. Um, mm -hmm. You know the the um, the public forum regarding um, the the logo. Okay, the, so the public uh, forum for this one would specifically be around the logo, correct? Not the logo and the warrior. Um, I I just think the. the I'm not warrior, sure that we can help people tease it out exactly. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, but we would vote on the 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 logo. Mm -hmm. and, um. I was, I was thinking, um, you know, we have our public forum on July 30th and perhaps vote on the logo then and or, uh, or the August 13th okay. for the logo. Um, what do you guys feel like? I know that we're coming up also on the Dale Street configuration. Yeah. 
to vote and that uh, I would certainly like to be able to make sure that we're understanding that is two very different votes. I mean, we, as school committee members we have, and a district, we have many, many different spinning plates. And if we are getting additional guidance from the state in August, mid-August, that looks very different from what we're thinking yeah. right now, I kind of feel like I don't want to give this issue short shrift. So, so I would also love. say, just to your point, Jess, um, in terms of what the state's going to be giving us, uh, we'll have a, we should have a budget by then too from the state, <laughs> um, hopefully. So what, yeah. what I heard today at my meeting was that um, we're looking at end of July, early August for those chapter 70 uh, numbers to come out, which would be very helpful for us as we enter the school year and have to make you know decisions around additional staffing or whether it's adding or reducing. So that will be probably on the docket in, in August as well. Um, and then we, we expect to have, and I'll get into it as we go lower on the agenda, we expect to have the final fall guidance the last week in July from this, from DESE as well. Okay. Um, and, and basically that's gonna be based on the most recent at that point, uh, mm -hmm. medical science on, on where we are with, with COVID-19. So I just, I just wanna put it out there. Those are some of the big issues that are coming up from my, my perspective too. So just keep that in mind. Yeah. Now, I'm not hanging my hat on the fact that it'll actually come out in the last week of July, but I do think it's, you know, it's something obviously we'll be talking about in the middle of August. As it's happening. Oh, just one thing Adam I want Chair. to clarify. Yeah, one second. Uh, one thing I want to clarify in terms of, I suppose folks are thinking of um, whether or not we're keeping um, Warrior. I think if, you know, that that's a longer process. If it's we a want much to longer change. process. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. But I think we can, we can have the, the discussions. I, I, I you know. Um, but we believe that we would be voting yeah. But we're on the logo itself. Correct. At the end of July, at that July 30th meeting. Correct. Do we feel like that that's oh, reasonable? Did she say the, the 13th? We might have on ourselves. I'm sorry, Lo. You know what? Well, did she say August 13th? I said or. So oh. I'm, well, I'm, I'm, cast, I, I'm asking you guys. I, I'd like to. I'd like to. Well, I guess, I guess we would, could leave that option open to vote on the 30th, but also the 13th. But I guess under the circumstances, perhaps. Um, I'd like to make a decision tonight to, to, to just so we're, when we're giving out our information, people know, you know. Yeah, I, absolutely. I would, well, and, and, and okay, well, I guess it depends. All right. So, all right, so Leo, because I would say we could, we could add a middle, we could add a meeting. I hate to do three weeks of meetings because I know how much, you know. Well, we could we do, love them. we could do public, and you know, I love a good meeting. Um, we could do public forum on the 16th and have the kids, uh, students do their input on the 30th if they can't do it any other time. And then we have those two pieces of information to be able to make our decision on the 30th. Okay. Um, but we would have to agree that we would be able to give <laughs> our students the amount of time that they need on the 30th to be able to speak to us. And we wouldn't necessarily take additional comment at that point from the, I mean, I, I, I guess I don't even know how to work that. Well, I wanna make sure there's appropriate reflection time for the decision. Right. And so that was one thing. Uh, second, um, if well, needed, if needed. Yeah, okay. uh, but more importantly, what to Jeff's point, <laughs> um, is because of all those items, we have Dale Street, and yeah. the reopening is huge. So those are, you know, those are really big. Um, and then not that this is not, I don't want to belittle this, but, um, but I want to make sure that all three items get the appropriate attention that is needed. And, you know, um, and we is still have any... discussion tonight. So uh, on the reopening, so. I mean, I, I, I tend to agree. I mean, anime, I, I see if you were to say, and target whether it's August 13th or the 30th, take a vote. It could be agree on a process to, um, you know, change or you know, to, if it is limited to mascot, that's that's one thing. But just like, I, I think we do, that this is multi-threaded. Cause I, you know, I mean, it, it brings in what's, what's the overarching school, how are we responding to diversity, inclusion and some of these other things. And, and so, I mean, we've done this with other topics we may have to take a step back and say we need to do a b c d 
um, so I, I, I just don't want to affirm, you know, whether it's the 30th or the 13th, where we're, we're, we're binary, we're going to make a change. Okay, once we did make that change, what happens? How do we, all right, so I, that's the only thing I, I think I'm glad to at least say, hey, this is what our sequence would be so that we can, we can um, have a more informed vote if, we, if we're getting to that point. So but, um, you know, I mean, this, this has been educational to me to say, yeah, there, there's other considerations. We, you know, like I've said right versus rush a couple weeks ago. I, I said I'd, I'd rather be leaning towards rushed, you know, while still being right. And, um, you know, I am, I am hearing right now, rushed is a relative term, right? So that, that, that's all, but I, I think we do have to think, okay, we're gonna do A, B, C, D. Like, it seems like, it, you know, as, as I'm hearing, it's not just a map, you know, it's clearly, we knew that anyways, but I think we, we will need to be, be able to speak in broader fashion. Yeah, there will be a process that has to be followed and turn it into an, a teachable moment throughout the school year, right? And so, but a decision would have to be made and then give the power, you know, give, empower the school department to, to, you know, do the education part throughout the, you know, the school year in whatever decision needs to be made around, you know, whatever that is. If it's keep the M, keep warriors. I mean, our focus right now is on the, you know, the logo and, um, and that's the conversation I think to be focused on to answer some of the concerns in the chat thread. Um, I mean, in the question thread. Yeah. Um, so I am thinking that um, let's have the, since we have a firm date for the students, um, let's have our public forum on the 30th. Okay. And um, we vote on the 13th. Okay. Um, so animate and uh, at all, I think that we should, uh, we need to be very clear about what it is to our community when we are talking about this public hearing or this forum, sorry, this is not a hearing. Um, we need to be very clear about what it is that we are deciding on. Yeah. And very clear about the input because I really don't want people to, I have always said with this process, people need to understand that we are not taking something away from them. We're actually adding something to our schools and to our children's education and to our community, right? So we need to be very clear that this is about logo and then the decision process around uh, warrior or not in our identity. And that that's a, a, a discussion that requires a, a great deal of respect and time, but this is about logo right now, so. Okay. Um, okay. Um, All righty. Uh, anime, do you, uh, there are a few more comments that I think came through. Should we uh, just quickly go through those? I'm not sure that any of them necessarily is, say something is, very different from. Well, they'll, uh, be in the, they'll be in the public record in the minutes. Okay. All right. Um, okay. I'm just thinking if there's anything. That is different. I think there's an alumni one that's impactful. I think Stephen Reich is, uh, yep, is already in there. Evan Berry, um, is that the one? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I mean, Christella is asking some reasonable questions as, yep. as well. So yeah, we can, we can just go through them because I think we've answered most of these, but I think that it's- Okay. Christella Wade, I would also like to make a this statement to the school committee that I personally am of Native American descent, also indigenous roots in Spain and Mexico. I would hope that as a resident of this town since 2007, her voice is heard, indeed. Um, I guess you, uh, Stephen Reich, I guess you have the big, big M as an option for the interim logo, so that's good. Completely. Um, Evan Berry, class of 2012 here, 12 reasons, um, 12 season varsity athlete and three season captain. I am incredibly proud that our community is having this critical conversation about changing our mascot. It was tough to represent our community back then when our mascot was a racist one and that has not changed. 
This imagery and appropriation of indigenous peoples and culture does not represent our values as a community. I am thankful for the leadership for the school committee here, and I hope you all know that we as alumni have your back here and if and when we make this change. We know this is a difficult decision to make, but it is a, but it is a critical point to stand on the right side of history. Medfield needs your leadership here. Thank you. Um, Caroline, the sooner the better for the vote. States and towns across the U.S. are making changes now. If Mississippi can change their state flag, Medfield can certainly change their logo. Christella, will the school committee allow for personal public testimony from tribal chiefs at the public forum? Yeah. It, it's going Anyone to be open door. Jessica, you said that we are not taking away. This Does is also Christella Wade Christella, saying. Christella, sorry, excuse me, Christella. Jessica, you, um, you just said we are not taking away. Does that mean you have already made your decision? Um, I am not speaking for the public body when I say this, Christella, but yes, I've thought about this for many years. I've read the research. I have done a lot of processing. Sometimes there are decisions that you just know are correct after doing the research. I can't necessarily tell you that, you've, that you will feel the same way. And I'm not speaking for the public body that is part of their vote. But for right now, um, I believe that uh, making or uh, getting uh, changing the logo or getting rid of the logo itself is the right decision as I think about it. But I am not think talking for the public body. I'm simply speaking in open meeting, which is um, why open meeting laws are here. It doesn't mean that I don't think the people's input is important. And uh, I am not necessarily an automaton, but I, I have a hard time thinking that I would change my idea about this. Now the warrior, that's a whole different discussion. I, I have a lot of things to be thinking about. And the last one, um, Jean Minia, point of clarification, there, there was a desire to hear from kids on the diversity, equity, inclusion, bi and bias, but July 30th is focused on the logo only. Yes, sorry, Jean. Yes, so the, the logo is July 30th, and if students want to, to talk about diverse, um, please have them contact me, absolutely, and we'll, um, um, we'll talk it through and set something up. So please have them reach out to me then, Jean. Sorry about that. All right. Um, so July 30th, vote August 13th, and um, the next item on the agenda, any other items, Dr. Marsden, on, um, on the agenda since posting on June 23rd? No other items, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Dale Street, Old Business, Dale Street School Project Timeline. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So we had a, our working group meeting this afternoon, um, and we're looking at the milestone. And I think the biggest um, decision that the school committee needs to look at in terms of the, the Dale Street is when the vote is going to be for uh, the grade configuration. So I, that the school committee um, needs to make that decision prior to submittal of the PSR in October. Um, so I think that in order to give the architects time to <clears throat> get all the necessary paperwork to submit to MSBA, then that decision would have to be made in at the latest late August or, or early September. Um, as of the, the start of the meeting this morning, uh, this afternoon, they had it uh, a vote of August 6th, uh, which, I mean, I, I voiced the opinion, I know that Leo um, did as well and, and just sat in on the meeting, um, that, you know, it, it <clears throat> It doesn't feel right to have that vote then, and, and it just feels like we need to have more input and, and really try to do that uh, when more people are around. So I think that was the conversation that we had. So looking at the timeline, um, we suggested August 27th as a meeting date. Uh, we already have it scheduled as a meeting, but also the voting time for grade configuration. I'm not sure that that will you know meet your needs, but that was what we had put out there. So um, if that's good, we can let them know that you're gonna, you're gonna uh, target that date for a vote. If not, we can look at, to, uh, I think September 16th or 17th is our first September meeting, but we could add, add one if you wanted to, or you can that keep the- That felt really late to them, right? Yeah, it did. It did because yeah. 
they got, there's a lot to put together um, prior to the submission to MSBA and a lot rides on what grade configuration. So essentially it's, it's half the work, right? Because right. Um, they only have to do one, they have to do a submittal for one grade configuration instead of two like we did for uh, the PDP. So um, whatever, whatever makes sense for you, but right now on the milestone calendar, it's scheduled for a vote on August 27th. I think the other thing was that uh, if we were to schedule it a week earlier, like if we were trying to split the middle ground between the middle of September and the end of August, that week, uh, we would end up what scheduling it for like September 3rd, right? which is the day before the, the evening before the Friday of Labor Day weekend. So that ends up really kind of messing with people's plans. Right. I think that, and again, I was just listening into this meeting um, and I'm not part of that committee, but I, I do have to say that there was a, I would rather kind of make sure that we got as many people there as possible on August 30th or uh, August 27th, sorry, um, than to be relatively well assured that people are taking off on that Friday uh, to go out of town on that uh, September 3rd. All right, yeah. I think that's it. Yeah, I think that that is good. And um, we can have um, a public forum on the August 27th on grade configuration. Or, sh uh, or should we have the public forum on grade configuration then on the 13th and then vote on the 27th? What would be the, what do you guys think would be the best process? I think the third. Anna May, let me just ask um, a public forum, and we had one you know, about a month ago, and um, great configuration seemed to me like a, a, a bigger, a big topic. We didn't necessarily go really deep on site selection. Right. There was some discussion about a public forum on site selection to help us as we also think about grade configuration. So I'm just, I, and, and it's, you know, I, I our, our no way, anyway, would it be, um, just I, one I, question, one, one sec, would it be a public forum almost as part two? Where have we advanced since the last time on both topics? Because they seem to be, in some cases, intermingled. Um, or are, are you suggesting, you know, we still, like, what, just talk to me about the public forums and what we're saying right now. Yeah, I like how you just phrased that, the part two, because I think that that last public forum was really sponsored by the school building um, committee. Whereas if we're, if we as school committee are charged to vote on um, grade configuration, I, I, you know, that was just a half hour presentation of everything. And we, I, I'd like to have a deeper dive on grade configuration and really understand um, at a deeper level and maybe, you know, maybe some more information will come out that will help us as well, um, especially regarding cost. So I think it's, it's, I would think that it's fair to just um, take a deeper look at the grade configuration be, again bef before we vote. Um, so those are my thoughts. Okay, and, I, and I'm also, I wanna make sure that the sequencing um, so, so we would be voting on high level grade configuration potentially August 27th and then voting on site selection at a later date or that's that and I, I again I'm not on there or, or that's out of our hands. Yeah, site, site selection is a building committee vote. Correct. Okay. That, 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 I got it. I got it. That, that's what I thought. So, okay. So, so that, that's good. So that, that they continue to do to, to move forward on that. Um, any other thoughts? Leo, what do you think? You're on that. You've been actually on that this committee longer than I have. Yeah, no, I think the, you know, having, you know, some discussion before the, you know, another round of discussion around grade configuration would be fine. Again, site selection has to do with the impact of the, you know, what the, what is found by the building, um, you know, the site surveys and everything else we've been finding the, the that committee is, um, has hired people to do and um, left field has hired people to do uh, around feasibility. 
but uh, they do need to, um, you know, they are estimating based on both um, two grades and three grades and at both sites. And our, um, I'm sorry, and, uh, you know, in our decision will impact, you know, that path forward. So um, I think it's, you know, um, I think we should have another, you know, opportunity to have people listen and for us to listen to it um, and then make a decision. Um, so the 27th, that works time-wise, right, Jeff? Yes. Yeah. So. Uh, will we be going back to 7 p.m. meetings at that point, do you think, or uh, we're sticking to the five o'clock, which I happen to personally enjoy, but um, I don't know what that, uh, whether we want to start evolving back. I mean, the emergency won't be over, I don't think, um, but I mean, if we're talking about uh, public hearings and letting people know, or public forums and letting people know about this, um, should we be uh, setting the time for that at this point? Anyone? Um, I, I'm, I'm flexible with timing. I mean, what, what do you think is, is seven o'clock people going back to work maybe more reasonable or? Um, or is that our last chance before people kind of go back to work to do the five o'clock time? So, and actually probably be 5.30 because I, I can't say that we wouldn't have a executive session. We could split the difference and start at six. <laughs> and confuse everyone. <laughs> well, <laughs> anyone else? Jeff, do you have an opinion? And we're gonna have to decide that now, but we should think I about mean, it. I think we've, we've had great attendance at five, we've had great attendance at seven. So I think, you know, as long as we're using the Zoom platform, we've had great attendance. So I think that if we wanna keep that platform, I'm sure we're still gonna be doing remote meetings at that point, so. Okay. I mean, All right, so we'll speak I mean, I think five gives us better bandwidth in terms of uh, people, you know, trying to get kids to bed and uh, just being able to kind of pop on and have their evenings a little freer. So it gives us more time, you know, if that should be more involved. So, okay. Thanks. Right. So five-ish. At this point, we're planning five, but we'll obviously let the people know. All right, anything else to note about Dale Street? Uh, I think there are a couple of questions. I don't know if we, uh, are you taking questions or comments? Um, yeah, okay. Um, Chris McHugh Potts, the diversity topic also relates to Dale Street project. In 1999, a historic preservation plan was published for the town with federal funds by a mass historical commission. The plan documents at least 8,500 years of prehistoric native American implements and other discoveries in Medfield in three archaeological protection zone, one of which encompassed proposed Wheelock site for Dale building. One, one of the town discoveries includes burial grounds very close to Elm Street location. Unlike historic buildings, our archaeological resources are out of public view and buried underground. The school committee members School committee members, are you aware about the sensitivity of the site? Have you researched that information to help guide your own decision making since the site selection is tied to grade configuration? While there, there will be steps taken to review the site with appropriate authorities, borings for soil testing are already problematic. The same activity generate, generated concerns behind Clark Tavern. Um, I have not heard about this, and I'm assuming that the school building committee will review this. Um, I can comment on that. Okay, thank you, Leo. Yeah, yeah so it was brought up that it was uh, it had archaeological significance due to the Great Fire, um, and it was referencing a building nearby on Elm Street that was a victim of the fire, which um, was rebuilt and still stands today um and not on the wheelock site so there is an archicad drawing online with a quick google search to locate that uh, that, that does show that does locate the archaeological archaeological significance of the area but not current that what we found on the wheelock site um, I and also i feel like i need to answer in terms of no i don't know about uh, the specific sensitivity that you're talking about in terms of archaeological protection zones uh, but our question for that evening is what is the best educational decision for 
uh, for the future of education in Medfield. And that needs to be in some way our recommendation. The building committee is really quite capable and the town being the owner of the building is quite capable of making the decisions about whether Wheelock is the appropriate site for the building. But our recommendation really needs to be about uh, whether it's a two grade or a three grade and what our educational and long-term thoughts are around that. So it really has very little to do with site selection. I understand that there are, you know, difficulties on both sites, frankly. Uh, there's no perfect place, but really our decision is about grade configuration that night. And well, the, the town has to take on. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Leo. Well, I was going to say, I will say from personal experience, growing up in Canton, a very active area for Native Americans, um, there was a break, uh, a development did break ground on Chapman Street where they did discover a burial ground. And uh, actually yeah. that site, that site remains there today. Right. <laughs> so. so sometimes things happen that you don't expect, but for, for the most part, our decision at that point is on great configuration, not site selection. So. Thank you, Jess. And second question, will you commit to holding a public hearing the night of grade configuration vote and provide 10 days advance notice? We've decided we're gonna do a public forum with six weeks notice and be um, and assure publicity for that um, public forum. All righty. So uh, next on the agenda, I'm looking on my phone. Let's see, school reopening, how can I forget? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> well, because there's a lot of other stuff going on. Yeah, a lot of excitement the last um, week or so around school reopening. Um, so, <clears throat> as I have told you before, that we, some superintendents got a heads up on what, the, what it may look like in terms of the guidance, um, and then all superintendents got one a week ago this past Friday, week ago this past Friday. Um, so we kind of had a heads up. So we spent two full days yesterday, the leadership team and I, uh, last week, going through and, and trying to plan for different scenarios. Um, we had a, a really good couple of days looking at what instruction and learning might look like, um, looking at some of the issues around the buildings and, and looking at three feet versus six feet and all the other uh, parameters that are in the guidance and looking to see what classrooms would work and what classrooms wouldn't work. So we had a really good couple of days working through that. Uh, we got the guidance on, um, was it Monday, I believe? It was a couple of days late. It was supposed to be last Friday. It didn't come through. We had a phone call on Thursday, a phone call on Friday, another one on Monday, another one on Tuesday. So we've been in touch with the state an awful lot during this entire process. Uh, but I wanted to just give you some of the highlights of where we are and what we're, we're planning on doing. Um, but we have a, a lot of work to do in the month of July and then certainly get some final guidance at the end of the month, <clears throat> which will continue that work into August so that we can have a safe reopening uh, for all of our kids in September. So the philosophy and approaches behind the COVID-19 um, is, is, is really to keep kids in school safely. Um, the, the goal is to return as many students as possible in an in, in-person school setting. Um, this, this guidance was really based on extensive review of the current medical literature. So working with the governor and the state were some of the top doctors in the world um, providing guidance on this. And I'm going to put all this on our website because we also got a letter from the American Academy of Pediatrics and some other, some other uh, doctors' uh, feedback on what we should be doing. So I'm going to put that on our, our website so parents can see that. Um, the guidance really tries to uh, balance the, the health and safety risk of COVID-19 with the health, safety, socioeconomic, and achievement risk of keeping our kids out of schools. That's an important piece that the entire state is looking at. Um, and then a real important piece of the guidance is not just one mitigation strategy, uh, but looking at accommodations of, of mitigation strategy and how they work together. Like for instance, um, the mitigation strategy of masks and face coverings. It's very important. Um, studies are saying that it has about an 80% effectiveness to prevent transmission. Um, you're seeing that across the country where states that have implemented face masks like Massachusetts have done, done really well at, at lowering the incidences of COVID-19 and other states like Florida and Texas have not done well. Um, and, and you see that the, the record numbers of COVID-19 cases in those states 
because they chose not to wear masks, which you know we have certainly done that. So there's there's guidance there in uh, which looks at second grade and up students uh, wearing masks, and um, you know that may change for the the second round of guidance in late July, but that's the initial guidance right now. Um, the physical distancing, and that's a term that I've used the last couple of meetings because we're getting away from the social distancing piece. We're calling it physical distancing. Um, and that helps mitigate the transmission. And we're, you know, it's now down to um, three feet where CDC for a long time was six feet. The international standard has been three feet all along for the last, you know, couple of months around that. So aim for six feet when feasible, but a minimum of three feet is what's in the guidance. Um, hand washing and hand sanitizing and then staying home with, with sick. And there's a, a real important piece in here for parents where um, they play an important role of making sure their child isn't sick and, and not sending their child to school. And one of the things that originally, I think in, in the beginning stage of these conversations that we we're gonna have to take the temperature of all kids when they get on the bus, take the temperature of all kids before they came into school. And you know the data on that really show that that's, there's a lot of false positives and a lot of false negatives. And it's just not accurate enough to do for the time and the money to introduce that to school. So um, it's really important for parents to, to be the real leaders in making sure that if their child is sick, that they stay home. So that was you know, the, the real important strategies that we're gonna use as a school district and that families can use as well to try to mitigate the issues around uh, COVID-19 transmission. So originally, um, the, what we need to plan for right now are the three possibilities of reopening. So the one is the in-person learning with new safety requirements. So students learn in person with safety requirements and to get as many students back in school, in person and safely. So that's the first thing that we're working on right now uh, with our leadership team is making sure that we can get students and staff back in, in a safe manner. The second uh, model that we have to plan for is the hybrid learning where students learn both in person and in remote. So that can be a situation where um, if the state, if the data changes around what's going on in the state and they say, okay, we're not gonna go to uh, re-entry, we're gonna do a, a hybrid learning system. So that, that part of the guidance was a little disappointing because uh, we were really pushing for a statewide uh, uniform guidance around hybrid learning so that whether it's a one week on, one week off, or um, two days on, three days off, some sort of uniform across the state, um, that didn't happen. They got the, the current guidance right now says that school districts will have the opportunity to choose what that hybrid model looks like, which is really going to be problematic, uh, especially when you're looking at child care issues with, with staff and that kind of thing. So what we, we met as a tri-county superintendents group this morning, we're going to look at trying to standardize that, at least for our area, uh, because that's, that's really going to be problematic if, if one town is doing, um, one of the models they talked about was uh, some ch children come in the morning and some come in the afternoon and switching that week to week. So I think that's one of the things that, you know, we're trying to um, try to figure out what the best one will be to fit, to fit for Medfield and then surrounding towns so that we're on a similar uh, schedule uh, in the area. And the other one is uh, looking at fully remote learning. So similar to what we've done in the last, you know, three months, which we know that um, there are some things that went really well and some things we need to do better. So that's what we're going to be working on this summer to make sure that if we do have to go to re remote learning, and it may be a pivot as quickly as 24 hours, you know, and I think what we're trying to push to in this remote learning, if we're all in the same uh, boat in terms of what the remote learning is going to look like and every district has that in place, then there's really no need for snow days anymore. There really isn't. So, you know, we should be able to um, set a calendar, the school commission set a calendar, and that end date should be the end date because if we have remote learning plans in the entire state, there should be no need at all for, for snow days anymore. So that's something that we're, we're trying to really encourage the um, commissioner to look at and, and plan for as we, as we get closer to the, the start of school. The other piece- oh, I think Jeff became the least popular person in Medfield. Yeah, well- Right now. Yeah, well, it's certainly gonna- yeah, at least with the kids. Help out my, my lack of sleep during the winter. Um, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that, that the commissioner is looking at, and again, this is not um, something that is set in stone at this point, but something that we'll probably get guidance on the next couple of weeks, is reducing our school year from 180 days to 177 days. And what that would do is provide three additional days in the beginning of the, this current school year uh, for additional teacher training and support 
um, for any one of these three plans. So that has not come out yet. Uh, the commissioner is still working with, I think, the Secretary of Education on that. Uh, but that, of course, you, you couldn't add three days to the school year because that would obviously um, cost money. So if contracts are already set and teachers are employed for 183 days like they are here, <clears throat> here in, in Medfield, um, by reducing the number of student days, it wouldn't impact the costs associated with, with teacher and staff contracts. So that's the thinking behind that, uh, but we should get some guidance on that fairly soon. So what, we've, uh, what we're doing tomorrow, uh, the leadership team and I are, are, are finalizing our building-based uh, COVID-19 teams, which are required in the guidance. Um, so we're finalizing all that tomorrow, and then we're looking at the structure of what the, the district advisory is going to be. And we've already identified nine days in July which will be either uh, building-based COVID-19 meeting days or district-wide meeting days or a combination of both. So that by the end of July, so we're looking at July 31st, the main deliverable is having a finished plan that has in-person learning, hybrid learning, and remote learning for all five schools. So that um, if there, our sense is right now that whatever the guidance that comes out in, at the end of uh, July, it would be a tweak to what we what we develop in the month. It's not going to be revamping at all. So we want to get ahead of that and get all that done um, and, and have that done by the end of the month. So the other piece around the comprehensive guidance and around guidance that's coming out. So this is the initial one. Um, there will be guidance on um, academic calendar considerations, prerequisites for in-person reopening, remote learning resources, special programs and populations, athletics, extracurriculars, and electives, transportation, facilities and operations, and then a process for handling COVID-19 positive cases within your school and school community. So that's all coming in the next three weeks on top of the more comprehensive guidance that comes at the end of the month. Um, based on you know, feedback from, from leadership, what we're gonna be looking at on the district level advisory um, is involving teachers, uh, union support, uh, union uh, representative, uh, support staff, uh, special education, ELL. Uh, we're going to identify parents from the school site council. We're going to identify students that are going to be a part of this. Uh, and we have uh, school nurses, school nurse leader, um, director facilities, a board of health representative. So we've, we've identified 34 people that will be on the district advisory, member of the school committee, all of that, so that we'll have um, the building-based advisory, getting into the weeds of all the things they need to get into, and then looking from the 30,000-foot view of the uh, district level of what we need to, to do on, as a district overall, um, overall. So that's where we are with that. Um, we're going to be sending out emails on that uh, tomorrow and Wednesday uh, to try to get as much uh, input because folks have to really commit to the nine days that we've identified. We can't just be there for one or two. We have to commit to the whole nine days. So we're off and running with that, where we feel pretty good about our plan and where we're going. Um, and really spending some time on, on the instruction piece, on what it's going to look like instruction learning, learning when we have a hybrid, when we have a remote learning, and then doing the necessary technical issues that have to get done uh, to bring our students back safely uh, in that model. So a lot of work ahead of us. Certainly, uh, you folks will be involved and, and you'll be part of the the communication as we go through the next two months, but uh, the summer's gonna look very, very different this year, that's for sure. Jeff, I have one question because I know that transportation was um, gonna be sort of an, an issue and, and kids riding the buses. Yep. I know that in earlier um, meetings, you had said that you would be sending some sort of survey around to the parents. Is that still the plan? Yeah, absolutely. I, thanks for reminding me, I left that part out. So we're gonna be surveying uh, teachers, we're, we're sending out a quick survey to teachers tomorrow, and then our goal is to do a sur quick survey to parents either Wednesday um, or the following Monday or Tuesday, probably the 7th, to get some of that information. So we're really looking at, um, uh, are you planning on sending your child back to school under the new guidance, and um, are you planning on using our bus transportation, just so we start to get some numbers, and then do that more than once, not just once, So it's because things will change. Um, you know, if if the data changes and um, you know we, we have to either dial it back or, or things get better, we don't know what's gonna happen with that. So 
we're, we're looking at maybe two to three week intervals on those surveys to try to get as much information as we can from parents and from teachers and staff. Um, and you guys know that I, I sent out the guidance to all families um, a few minutes after it was released. Uh, one of the issues, one of the issues that happened was um, it was going to be released at 10 o'clock um, and someone uh, leaked it to the Globe and the Globe put a story about it the night before. So that became problematic. And I think, you know, we, we try to, the state does a really good job of in, informing the people that have to know a little early so we can have a heads up on it. Uh, but somehow it got out to the general public before we're supposed to. So um, again, not, nothing, no harm or damage. It just, it threw their timing off a little bit. Jeff, are we looking yeah. at things, I'm sorry. Uh, are we looking at things like uh, portable hand washing stations within the schools? I'm trying to think of how long it takes for you know 20 kids to wash their hands just at a normal and average snack time. But if we're looking kind of multiple hand washings a day, and also we had talked at one point about how we actually find that isolated space within school buildings. Um, are there any kind of developments there? Yeah. So we. We, um, we have portable um, hand sanitizer stations that we're gonna be having. And, and, and most of them, every building has them now. Uh, right. We're just gonna add additional ones. Uh, we're fortunate that some of our elementaries have sinks right in the classroom, so that's gonna be helpful. Um, and then we're looking at the number of sinks that we have in the other buildings. Again, we didn't build the buildings 30, 40 years ago with this in mind, you know? So we're trying to, to retrofit what we can and do that. Um, the other piece is this, in terms of the space, it looks like we're probably going to um, look at getting the medical tents for each building and put them in a, in a place where um, they're not the first thing you see as you drive up, but a place where it's safe for the nurses to um, be with kids. And that's, for those of you that don't know, the requirement is to have a separate space for any students that, any student that's suspected or having COVID-19 um, symptoms while they're in school is to take that student and, and bring them to another room. Well, we don't have any space in any of our five buildings where we can do that without taking a classroom space away. Um, so we're going to look at doing the tents um, outside. They're heated. They're easy access. Uh, we think it's it's the best uh, the, the best thing for us to do right now, and we'll have that all in place for the start of school. Is that a leasing or a buying issue? Um, that's going to be a buying issue, but we're we're pretty confident that's going to be a reimbursement issue because we're buying it for for the COVID nineteen. So we'll we'll get reimbursement for that. Um, with anything associated with it. So that's what we're looking at doing. All right, thanks. Now, Jeff, um, in addition to surveying parents of, about transportation, where they're gonna send their kids and, and multiple times um, throughout the summer. Now, how about teachers? You know, um, in, in I mean, I listen to, you know, the radio and college professors are, you know, who are compromised, they can't really do that. So right. I'm just wondering what, what is our strategy in finding out who, who's able to teach, you know? So that, that's, that's the first survey that's going out tomorrow at noontime, okay. is the teacher one, yeah. So that's really to see, you know, what, how they're feeling about the guidance, you know, what, the, what their sense is about coming back and all that. So that, that's what the first one, because we really can't do our planning, um, you know, in, in July, without we need to know how many teachers are going to be here right so we need to know all of that so that's why uh, that's the first one and then we're going to um, get the ones from the parents as well because i've seen really different different numbers out there um, you know there's there's been some some polls that have been done in uh, from various news agencies so um, you know i think it's it's difficult we're, we're in an uphill battle we we have you know one day the headline the globe is that you know the guidance is out and and they're, they're, it's very positive. And then the next day is a, there's an article about how people don't want to send their kids to school. They don't think it's safe. And it's just, it's just all over the place. Right. And I think that we want to get a real sense of what people are thinking in our town. And um, I certainly have heard enough from folks that want our kids back and I, but there's got to be some population that, that does not. So um, I'm sure we'll, we'll hear from them through that survey. And the other piece is, and I, I know we, we said before that we want to make sure that we get, um, identifying information from folks. We have to get identifying information this time because we need to know who the kids are, uh, who the parents are, who the teachers are. So that's gonna be a component or a required component of the survey is, is what your name is and who your children are so that we can 
um, get a good sense of what it looks like in each grade level. Uh, but the, so that's a little bit different than what we typically do. It's typically anonymous, but we really need to get that information this time around. Have there been any uh, increases in our uh, class sizes, as as the case may be? I mean, obviously, we always look at kindergarten, but have we noticed any influx in the last month? No, nothing in the last month. Okay. Um, I, I've gotten, uh, I think, three requests for homeschooling in the last two weeks. That's that's uh, the only changes I've seen so far. Okay. Um, which, you know, I typically get, typically get under five a year. So I'm right around five or six right now. So, um, you yeah. know, that's where people and are How at. fluid is homeschooling? Can kids re-enter the district Absolutely. Uh, whenever they want to? Yeah. Absolutely. So if things look better and that, that feels like the decision they want to do for the first couple of months, just to see how things are going. Right. Obviously it's a little disruptive in terms of, you know, getting kids into class, but we do it all the time. Right. Yeah, and I'm also sure, I mean, they haven't, the, the homeschooling requests I've gotten haven't been explicitly about what's going on okay. with COVID-19. Um, you know, lots of time religious reasons and things like that that we typically get homeschoolers for, so. Yeah. Okay. Jeff, Jeff what about um, spacing in the classrooms? Uh, you know, I know some of the classrooms are tight on space, uh, three feet uh, with a class of 22 and plus seems tight. Actually, if you, if you think back to, and this is one of the interesting things that's happening, um, when you think back to when you were in school or even before that, uh, when kids were in rows, mm. in, in, that was about in rows, that's just about three feet. So yeah. if you can think back to your experience in elementary or middle or high school where you were in rows, that's what it looks like. Uh, you know, the unfortunate educational part is we've we feel like we're, we're going backwards in that regard because yeah. we want to do collaboration with kids and have them work together. Uh, but I, I still think you know, we'll take the three feet in rows over um, staying home and remote learning any day. I think the, the issue we have, Leo, uh, is because we, we, we foster that culture of collaboration, we've done so many tables uh, for yeah. kids to sit forward table. So we're looking at, we, we put desks in storage a few years ago. So we're going we're gonna to bring those out the next couple of weeks, see what we have. Uh, but there is probably going to be a need to purchase additional desks uh, at different grade levels because of this. So again, that's going to be a COVID-19 uh, reimbursement or CARES Act situation because, um, as you know, so so well, uh, we we got to get your order in. We cut our budget, so uh, yeah. we don't have the money there to do that. So that's one of the things that we're looking at right now. The high school is actually in decent shape. We can fit comfortably um, 22, 23, 24 at three foot intervals. Uh, we've, we've done it in a couple of classrooms. Middle school, uh, similar. All, there's a couple of classrooms at the middle school we might have to swap out uh, based on the numbers that we're seeing. And then Michael and I are going to uh, Wheelock and Memorial tomorrow uh, to, to look at their setup at first thing in the morning uh, before we have our leadership meeting. So we're gonna look at those numbers, but it, it could be in a, you know, additional purchase of, of desks to make sure that uh, we stay within the three feet. Jeff, I know one of the um, one of the parts of the guidance suggested, or was maybe it wasn't a suggestion, but maybe just a hypothetical of keeping the kids as close as they can into cohorts or groups. Um, right. In terms of like, I know right now you're putting schedules together for high school. Is there any kind of plan to do that with and how would you do that in a high school setting yeah, that's well so but that was part of our meeting today um and, and no one has really come up with that as a, any idea for that in a high school setting mm -hmm. certainly um easy in elementary um with our cluster model at blake that's it's fairly doable as well uh mm -hmm. but with a high school situation it, it's really difficult so we're going to look at things like uh, instead of the, looking at the cohort looking at things like bell schedules, you know, do you adjust the bell schedule so you only have a certain amount of kids in the hallway at the same time? And then so have multiple bells for periods so you don't have so many kids all at the same time leaving. So trying to distance, physically distance kids that way. You know, the lunch is gonna be problematic because they're, they're recommending in the guidance to have lunch in the classrooms, but there's some flexibility around that, uh, especially at the high school level. So we're looking at, um, using some gym space if we need to, or the bleachers. Uh, we'd like to 
uh, try to, once this is all over with the, with the restaurants in town, maybe ask them for a donation of their picnic tables and put those all around the high school and middle school as well so that we can have kids outside because we know that outside is better. So, um, you know, trying to do things like that, trying to think out of the box a little bit so that we're not just cramming kids inside of a classroom to have their lunch. You know, again, much easier at the elementary level to do that. There are many elementary schools that do that on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to really try to target some of the older kids and that where there's some space concerns and have them uh, space out in different areas for lunch. Be a picnic table fundraiser in the future. We'll yeah. We'll need a picnic table. <laughs> right. Right. Well, there are plenty of them around town right now. So yeah, yeah we, have, look great. we have our eye on a few of them. <laughs> All righty. Oh, and um, I, I will take a couple of these. Um, there are just three questions in here. Um, Chris McHugh Potts, is there a music department representative on the group? Ensemble um, impact is huge. There's been no determination who's on there yet. We're, okay. we're doing that. We're doing that tomorrow. Okay. Do we? Um, this is from I, Irene Calendar. Um, do we want to only limit it for teachers that live in Medfield or surrounding towns? Touching it. I don't. I don't know what that question is referring to. <laughs> I wonder if that was referring to the teacher conversation about who would want to teach or something like that. Okay. I, okay. I think that's when that popped up. I'm not sure though. She can repost yeah. it. Clarify. Yeah. And Melissa Coughlin, um, this will most likely be discussed with your reentry group. Are you planning to increase the number of school nurses in order to cover the triage of students with COVID-19 systems? You know, at this point, we are not. Um, I would say that if you look around other districts, we have more nurse support. We have, um, you know, two at the high school, one and a half at, at Blake, and every other elementary school has a full-time nurse. That is not the case throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So. Uh, at this point, we're not, but, but if we get into a situation where we need to, we'll absolutely, uh, Melissa, absolutely look at doing something to add additional nurses. Okay. Great. Any other? Jeff, I, I just, um, more, Jeff or Michael, I, I know they reference different funding sources and, you know, funding vehicles. Any, any surprises there or anything um, that <laughs> looked look, you know, positive or, or new sources that we hadn't thought about, or is it just, I would, you know, I would say the biggest, unknown? the biggest um, disappointment out of that. And, and I've had a subsequent conversation is that it looks like they're going to utilize the, the chapter title one funding mechanism again, which is not good for Medfield. So if no. they use that as a disbursement method, we're not going to get much at all, which is really disappointing. As you know, we got $20,000 in CARES Act, uh, which is the bare minimum you can get. So I don't know if they're going to change that, but that's their, their initial thinking is to disperse through Title I. Uh, is that something that we should be talking to Denise and Sean about? I mean, is there any even possibility of wiggle room around that? Uh, sure. I mean, I, all that- You can always out, talk. Right? It's just- you Yeah, you can, you can always have that conversation. I think that's an important thing. I mentioned it to both of them uh, prior to the, the CARES Act that how little benefit we got. Um, any of that so they, they know that uh, but I, I think a reminder kind of desperate. Certainly, yeah. you know a reminder certainly can't hurt okay most, most unfortunate when I read that um, all right um, anything else? we even um and this is this is out there but uh <laughs> would there be a sudden run on desks you know Jeff what like once we've determined what we have versus what we need Lots of districts might suddenly be looking for them. Well, or do we have? If we have enough, then I will gladly bring it to you to uh, certify a surplus, and we'll sell them. We'll have a we'll have a rummage sale of desks, but I think we need them all for us these days. Yeah, no, I was looking at it the other way. Other I'm way. sure if that's the route we're going down. Do we do we have? Yeah, how soon would we know if we have enough? Yeah, yeah, we recommend that we order them sooner rather than later. <laughs> No, yeah, we've already looked into all that. I mean, it's, it's, and the problem is like, if you've tried to buy anything these days, manufacturing <laughs> plants have been down for, for months as well. So you really can't get a lot of anything, you know, um, so that everyone's behind. So that whether or not it's even, even going to be there for us is a whole other issue. Uh, but we're going to try our own, uh, what we have our own uh, stock right now. And then uh, we'll, by next week, we'll have a really good sense of exactly what we need to get. 
Um, and I'll take this last question. Um, Bonnie Wren Burgess, can you please state the number of attendees at the meeting today? I think at the peak, I think I saw 36. Did anyone see? I saw 47. I, I, saw, 50, I saw 51. Okay, yeah. there you go. So, yeah. Great turnout, very grateful. Um, so yes, all right. Anything else, folks? Dates for uh, listening sessions on back to school. Yeah, so you, you probably want to figure out a time. Uh, we put that in the email. Uh, we'd have a listening session um, with parents. So you guys can check, out, check out a date. You probably want to choose one soon. Yeah, how about the July 16th one? That's our next one. Uh, but we are doing the uh, feedback for, oh, no, we aren't. That's July 30th. That, yeah. OK. Yeah. So much input, so little time. I think the July 16th one is, is a good one. Sure, it makes sense. That'll work. Yep, they'll have time, yeah. Give Jeff time with his folks to. We'll get an email out to parents on that too. Beautiful. Okay. All right. And as always, uh, for those out there in TV land or Zoom land, please uh, write us if you have concerns about any of the things that you maybe weren't able to comment on tonight. And that's what I have to say. Might be worth on the listening one to have um, that one broadcast if, uh, if the uh, public access would do that, um, just to broaden the, the exposure to, this conversa to the conversation and information that I'm sure you'll have more of by then. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not sure how to go about that anime, but. Yeah, no, I do. I know they have some. They have some YouTube's magic. They work now. Yeah, on the they're... interwebs. Yeah. On the interwebs. On the interwebs. <laughs> all right, that's a good idea. Thank you. Um, already. All right. So, any closing comments? <laughs> so much for a short, brief, intermediary meeting. <laughs> all right. That's all right. Um, <laughs> thing. All right, so we're meeting on July 16th. If anyone has anything else to add before we adjourn, I think we've said a lot. Good. Yeah. Um, Motion to adjourn. Thank you. Leo, second. Jess. Second. Um, take a roll call vote. Jess Riley. Aye. Leo Brem. Aye. Megan Glenn. Aye. Tim Knight. Aye. Anna May O'Shea Brook. Aye. All righty. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Ciao.